Driving down a busy street in Los Angeles, John paused in astonishment. He noticed a woman with four small children, all remarkably similar to him. He couldn't have known how his curiosity would unfold. The roar of his Lamborghini echoed through the city as John, a 30-year-old man in expensive sunglasses, relished the power and control his luxury car provided. There are paths we don't choose, but which choose us to unveil the truths we've forgotten. It was a bright day, the sun shining brightly. Lost in thought, John had become a successful millionaire thanks to his tech company. He was a confirmed bachelor, used to getting everything he wanted with a simple command. But year after year, he felt the emptiness, the joylessness of expensive cars and glamorous women who always surrounded him. His successful company, all of it became meaningless, empty. He'd spent his life in fleeting, insignificant romances, giving them no meaning beyond the momentary pleasure. He started to crave warmth, a family, a home to return to each evening. Stopped at a crosswalk, his gaze wandered aimlessly over the sidewalk, expecting nothing extraordinary. That's when he saw them, a young woman, pushing a stroller, and four children, all barely five years old. The scene would have been ordinary if not for one astonishing fact, the children were his exact double. It wasn't just a casual resemblance, they stood before him like four versions of his childhood self. John frowned, his hands tightening on the steering wheel. How is that even possible, he whispered to himself, unable to tear his eyes away. His heart pounded with an unfamiliar force, searching for an explanation. He couldn't seem to come back to himself. A line of cars formed behind him, their horns blaring impatiently. At that moment, snapping out of his thoughts, he saw an inscription on a nearby wall, children are born not from blood, but from love. Without hesitation, he swerved toward the crosswalk. The Lamborghini screeched through the intersection, and John quickly caught up with the woman on the corner. He stopped abruptly, hiding his eyes behind his dark glasses. The woman froze, startled by the sudden appearance of a man exuding elegance and confidence, not someone you'd expect at a busy intersection in LA. But it was the way he looked at her children that truly unsettled her. Instinctively, she positioned herself in front of her kids, shielding them behind her. The children, with their big, sparkling eyes and mischievous expressions, looked at him with curiosity. Their innocence was undeniable, and the resemblance was unmistakable. John stood motionless, gazing at them before stepping towards the woman. His voice was low, laced with the astonishment he couldn't conceal. What's the father of these children's name, he asked, directly and without preamble, his tone impatient. Irina, a Belarusian immigrant, stood before him, her face weary yet resolute. She looked at him with suspicion, her maternal instinct kicking in, protecting her children. She wasn't accustomed to such directness, especially from someone like John, whose appearance screamed wealth and authority. That's none of your business, she retorted, her voice cold, holding one of her child's hands tightly. Pride and defiance filled her gaze as she refused to look away. It is my business, John countered, slowly removing his dark glasses, revealing his light eyes. Those same eyes as the four children standing before him. These children look a lot like me. You see that too, don't you? Irina's gaze flickered between the children and John. The resemblance was undeniable, as clear as a drop of water. She felt a lump forming in her throat. It can't be, she thought. Her mind raced, her thoughts spinning in every direction. She was stunned but managed to pull herself together and answer John's question. The resemblance is striking, but they have no father, she said, her voice trembling, her words laced with the firmness of a woman trying to protect her secret. They're just my children. John took another step toward her, his gaze piercing yet calm, as if he didn't want to frighten her but wouldn't let it go unanswered. Listen, he said. I swear on God that I don't want to harm you. But I need the truth. Who is the father of these children? Irina met his gaze, her expression resolute, wrestling with her internal emotions. She wanted to protect her children, to distance herself from this man who could complicate their lives, but she couldn't deny what she saw before her. You have no right to ask me these questions, she shot back, her voice rising with tension. They have no father. I told you. Please, listen. I don't know how it could have happened, he pleaded, his tone softening. 
I don't have a twin brother, not even siblings. There has to be a reason. Please, help me understand. Irina paled, lost for words, not knowing how to respond. John looked at her, his thoughts flashing through his mind. A distant memory surfaced, a decision he'd made, a decision that had seemed inconsequential then but now felt full of meaning. He moved closer to Irina, their eyes meeting. Tell me, he asked, his voice heavy with emotions he struggled to conceal. Were you at a fertility clinic in Los Angeles about six years ago? Irina froze, as if struck by an electric shock. Her face paled, her lips trembling slightly. She tried to maintain her composure, but the truth was written on her every move. Memories of those difficult days, filled with uncertainty and loneliness, flooded back like a storm. She lowered her gaze, unable to meet John's eyes. Yes, she choked out, barely audible. John felt the ground beneath him crumble. Everything started to fit together, but in an utterly unexpected way. Years ago, when his stock market investments were failing and his financial troubles were mounting, he made a decision he rarely thought about. In a moment of desperation, he decided to be a sperm donor to get quick cash. He'd signed a strict contract that his donation would be used only once, for a single woman. Now, for children stood before him, each bearing his features, mirroring his own image. He ran his hand through his hair, trying to process what was happening. My children, he whispered to himself, acknowledging the truth. His legs felt weak, and he stepped back to lean against his car for support. John took a shaky breath. His voice was more confident, but still tinged with doubt. Get in the car with the children, he said, surprising himself with his determination. Don't ask questions. I need your help. This is a matter of life and death. He was insistent. She didn't know what to do. It felt like her world had turned upside down in an instant, but something inside told her to trust this man who seemed somehow connected to her children. Without saying a word, she turned to her four little ones, who, unaware of the gravity of the situation, gazed at John with curiosity, even a hint of affection. Hesitating for a moment, Irina nodded. He's not a maniac, is he, she thought. But I need to get to the bottom of this. Okay, she whispered. When Irina and the children approached the car, the little ones stopped, staring with wonder at the shiny, bright vehicle. Their eyes lit up with excitement, and the most curious of them cautiously touched the door. Mommy, is this our new car? the boy asked, not taking his eyes off the beautiful interior. John opened the door and smiled faintly. The children, holding their breath, climbed in one by one, carefully settling into the soft seats, their eyes gleaming as they explored the plush surroundings. Wow, it's so beautiful, exclaimed a girl, her eyes wide with admiration, taking in everything around her. She was the most daring, with a strong personality, clearly the oldest of the siblings. When the engine roared to life, the children clung to their seats, startled, freezing for a moment. One of them even pressed against his sister. Soon, though, they were all laughing, enjoying the ride. Wow, how fast, cried one of the boys, looking at John with a radiant smile. The children looked happy, a bit bewildered, and John suddenly felt a warmth inside. He realized what was happening was like a dream. A heavy silence descended inside the car, as if stifling any attempt at conversation. John gripped the steering wheel tightly, his gaze fixed on the road. Irina sat beside him, oblivious to the luxurious surroundings, her mind consumed by thoughts of how she would explain all this to her children. The children, with their innocent, carefree nature, observed the passers-by and the streets, oblivious to the anxiety that enveloped the adults. Finally, John broke the silence, his voice quiet, almost a whisper, but imbued with a restrained tension. What's your name? he asked with genuine interest. Irina Orlova, she replied, her voice weak, as if she were speaking in a whisper. Why did you decide to go through donor insemination, he asked, not breaking his gaze from the road. Why did you choose this path when you're so beautiful and strong? Why didn't you have someone by your side to share this important event with you? He paused, trying not to sound harsh. Surprised by his question, Irina turned her gaze towards the window. Her lips tightened as she searched for words. 
she remained silent for a few seconds before taking a deep breath and speaking calmly. It's not always easy to explain why we choose the paths we do, she said. Her voice was gentle, filled with a hidden wisdom. Sometimes, life pushes us onto roads we hadn't planned for, and we start fighting for what we thought we'd never be able to achieve. John listened intently, not interrupting, absorbing every word. I came from Belarus nine years ago, she continued. I had a husband. At first, everything was perfect, or so I thought. But soon, things turned terrible. He belittled me, blamed me for not being able to give him a child. We were together for three years, and during that time, he made me believe that my worth as a woman depended on whether or not I could be a mother. She fell silent, lost in bitter memories. Her gaze drifted into the past. When the diagnosis finally came, she said, her voice barely above a whisper, the word infertility hit me like a death sentence. My marriage fell apart, not because I wanted it to, but because he couldn't see me as anything but a failure, a woman who couldn't fulfill society's expectations for a woman. John felt his throat tighten. He couldn't imagine what she had gone through. We divorced quickly, she continued. The court awarded me the apartment we shared, everything else went to him. I gathered all my savings and decided that if I was going to be a mother, I would do it my way. I invested everything I had in IVF. It was a risk, and I knew it. But when life pushes you toward the edge of a cliff, you have to decide whether to jump with hope or despair. Irina added that after successfully going through all the necessary procedures, lying on the ultrasound table, dreaming of seeing what she desired, the sonographer had excitedly told her, Congratulations, you're going to be a mother. She paused, her voice trembling, but with a strength gained from overcoming hardship. A mother of four children, of course. She was shocked, overwhelmed. Irina stopped again, taking a deep breath, her voice breaking, but her words carried the strength she had accumulated through all her hardships. Nine months later, my quadruplets were born. John, they are my everything in this life, my strength, my joy. Everything I do is for them. I haven't looked for a man to provide for them or rescue me. My children are my purpose. They are my. The engine fell silent. John was struck not just by her story, but by the calm with which she told it. He had never met anyone who looked at life so deeply, with such clarity. In his circle, everyone valued money, external appearances, quick fame. But Irina spoke with a depth he couldn't understand until this very moment. You know, she said with a soft smile, though her eyes were wet, sometimes life shatters us so we can rebuild ourselves, stronger, with a deeper understanding. Some people only see the superficial glitter. They'll never comprehend this. But those who've been through the darkness know that true gold lies beneath layers of dust. My children are that gold. It doesn't matter how they came into the world, they are my greatest treasure. Silence returned to the car, but this time, it was a silence of understanding. While the children played in the back seat, John felt something shift inside him for the first time in years, as if the weight of superficiality had lifted from his eyes, revealing a truth he had never sought or even considered seeking. He realized he no longer wanted to postpone this important conversation. John decided to confess where they were actually headed, turning to Irina, preparing to tell her the truth. I want you to know where we're going, he began, trying to sound confident. We're heading to the clinic where I can officially confirm that I am the father of these four children. It's important to me. I hope you don't mind. To his surprise, Irina didn't object. She listened intently, nodding. It was obvious to her that they were his children, but perhaps she wanted to believe it. They arrived at the clinic, and John immediately went to the registration desk to arrange an emergency DNA test. They were told the results would be available in an hour, but for John, that hour felt like an eternity. He couldn't hide his anxiety. His face was tense, his hands trembling slightly. Contradictory emotions raged within him. The results could forever alter his life. Irina, on the other hand, seemed calm. She stood beside him with a slight smile, not sharing his anxiety. She had nothing to lose or gain in those moments. She was the mother of these children, and that wouldn't change. 
But watching John, she remembered her own feelings when she had gone for the IVF procedure, when they had handed her the results. John felt his heart pounding as if it would burst out of his chest. Holding the envelope containing the answer, he hesitated for a moment, reluctant to open it. But Irina's gaze, her composure, and the word father pulsing through his mind, brought the realization crashing down upon him. He wasn't just their biological father, he was now responsible for their lives, their happiness, their future. A wave of warm emotion, unfamiliar to him before, surged through him. His hands stopped trembling, his vision cleared, and he finally looked at Irina and the children with new understanding. The children, who resembled him, were indeed his children. Irina, noticing the change in his face, gently touched his shoulder. I can't believe it. They have a father now. We need to find a way to tell the children, she said. John could only nod, lost for words. He felt as if he had just discovered the most important truth of his life. John and Irina quickly gathered themselves and left the clinic. They got in the car. Overcoming his nervousness, John turned to the children, who were happily playing in the back seat, completely unaware that their lives had just changed. He realized he didn't even know their names. He turned to them with a soft smile. Hey, guys, he began. Let's get acquainted. I'm John. He extended his hand, as if inviting them to get to know him. The children, delighted, embraced the idea. One by one, they shared their names and little bits about themselves. John's smile never left his face as he listened, learning who loved to draw, who was fascinated by cars, and who dreamed of becoming an astronaut and a ballerina. Each name, each interest, seemed like a priceless detail revealing these amazing little personalities. Gradually, the children began to feel more comfortable around him. Irina, observing this moment, also smiled, sensing that the ice between John and the children was starting to melt. When everyone had settled in a bit, John looked at the children with warmth and finally decided to have the big conversation. Now, I want to tell you something very important, he continued, looking each of them in the eyes. I'm your father. You've noticed that we look a lot alike. Now we know for sure, which means we have a lot more time to get to know each other. When John informed the children that he was their father, a moment of silence fell over the car, followed by a burst of joyful laughter and exclamations. The children, as if realizing it, started comparing their features to John's, eagerly pointing out the similarities. I have the same eyes as you, one of the boys shouted excitedly, opening his dark eyes wide to show John. And I have your nose, chimed in a girl, giggling and touching her nose. And we all have the same hair as you, observed another child, tousling his light curls and looking at John with pride. They started examining each other, finding matching features and comparing themselves to him. John couldn't hold back his smile, watching as the children found their reflections in him, recognizing tiny parts of themselves in him. In that moment, he realized these similarities were more than just physical. He offered Irina and the children a chance to meet someone else who was very important to him. Who is it? One of the boys asked, his eyes widening. You'll find out soon, but this can't wait, replied John, a gentle smile on his face. The children looked at each other, and Irina, sensing the seriousness in his tone, nodded. John felt that this meeting would be another important step for all of them. The silence in the car was broken by the soft screech of the Lamborghini's tires as John stopped. Everyone noticed the large, beautiful house. The high gates swung open automatically, revealing a vast expanse. The children, unable to contain their excitement, jumped out of the car, running and laughing among the green pathways surrounding the house. Children, be careful! Irina exclaimed, trying to bring them to order. Careful of the flowers! But her efforts were futile. The four little ones ran merrily, mesmerized by the vast space around them. Irina, a bit embarrassed by her inability to calm them, looked at John as if seeking an apology. But he simply said, let them run, with an unexpected calmness that surprised her. They are home, with their father. His words hung in the air, bringing a mixture of confusion and admiration to her. There was something odd about his statement, yet deeply significant. Why did you bring us here, she asked, utterly bewildered. You said, but why? John looked at her for a moment, 
maintaining his mysterious demeanor. Then, extending his hand, he said softly, let's all go inside. Irina, caught in a wave of confused delight, followed John, her children scurrying behind, laughing and running around him as he led them towards the house. They walked down a long, carpeted hallway until John stopped before a door, which seemed a bit more welcoming than the rest. The room beyond was illuminated only by a bedside lamp, illuminating an old-fashioned bed. John, my dear, a frail voice called out from the room. The voice belonged to an elderly woman, around seventy years old, sitting on the bed. Her body was frail, her eyes clouded, yet her expression held an inner strength despite her physical weakness. John took a step closer, and his usual air of confidence and control vanished, revealing a vulnerability Irina hadn't noticed during their journey. This is my grandmother, Helen, John whispered to Irina. She raised me from childhood. He approached the bed, gently taking his grandmother's hand, and in a voice that unexpectedly faltered, said, Grandma, I don't want you to leave this world without fulfilling your greatest wish. I've brought you more than one great-grandchild, he stammered, choked with emotion. I've brought you four. The old woman's eyes, barely able to focus, widened. A silent tear rolled down her cheek. Silence filled the room as if time had stood still. For, she whispered, trying to comprehend what she had heard. My great-grandchildren? John nodded, his hand shaking slightly as he acknowledged the seriousness of the moment. Irina, in a gesture of profound respect, moved closer to the bed and knelt beside the elderly woman. She took her other hand in hers and spoke softly, pouring all her love and gratitude into every word. Yes, Helen. They're your great-grandchildren. They were born with immense love and have been a light in my life. Now, they're a light in yours. Helen, deeply touched by Irina's words, squeezed her hands as tightly as her weakened strength allowed. My dear, she whispered, her voice weak, but the truth within it unquenchable. The life you've brought to this house is a gift that no stars or heavens can measure. I don't know how these children came to you, how fate intertwined your heart with their tiny hearts, but I feel deep inside that your love for them was destined long before the wind whispered their names. I see in your eyes the tenderness that only true love can give. Tears filled Irina's eyes, but her smile never faded. It was an unexpected moment, breathtakingly beautiful. The bond that had just formed between her and the grandmother was deep, extending beyond blood ties. John stood nearby, watching, feeling his heart beat for the first time in a long time not just to the rhythm of business success and achievements, but with the warmth of peace. He had sought this in his life, without even knowing it until this very moment. The children, who had been curiously watching from the doorway, ran to the bed and settled around their great-grandmother, their tiny hands enveloping hers. Surrounded by these four little symbols of her lineage, the old woman smiled with an ineffable tenderness. Now I can leave peacefully, she whispered, looking at John with love and peace in her eyes. Because I see what truly matters. Deeply moved by her words, Irina leaned down and kissed the old woman's hand, silently promising in her heart to preserve this new, vital family for all of them. And what are their names, my dear? What are the names of these angels you've brought into my life? Helen asked, a warm, soft smile on her face. With a gentle smile and a voice filled with boundless maternal love, Irina answered. Each of her words sounded like a quiet, sincere whisper. Each of them has a name with deep meaning. Lyra, the eldest, her name symbolizes the light that always finds its way, even through the darkest shadows. Andrew, his name means that love is the force that conquers all. Zachary, the embodiment of divine miracles in every moment of life. And Matthew, the boundless love that never runs dry, the love that stays with us forever. Helen, deeply touched by Irina's words, held the children's tiny hands with endless tenderness. John, who had been silently observing, felt a tear roll down his cheek. He had never experienced such a genuine, profound moment. He saw not just four children, but the promise of an eternal something, something he perhaps had always sought, even without realizing it. That night, after the emotional meeting with his grandmother, John knew he couldn't let Irina and the children return to their small apartment. As they sat in the spacious living room of the mansion, the children, lulled to sleep, resting peacefully in Irina's arms, Irina looked around curiously, taking in the surroundings. 
John broke the silence. I want you to stay here, he said calmly, but with a sincerity she couldn't ignore. There's plenty of room for everyone. I don't want you to go back to that tiny apartment. Don't worry about things, I'll buy you a new place tomorrow morning. But tonight, I want you to be comfortable. Irina looked at him, a little surprised by his generosity, but she also saw the sincerity in his eyes. Her life had been a constant struggle, but this man, with all his flaws, seemed to offer something more than just material support. He offered something far more valuable. You know, John, she said quietly, material things don't bring happiness, but sometimes you have to learn to accept what's offered to you with gratitude, because love is measured not just by what we give, but by what we're willing to receive. John nodded, moved by her words. Without hesitation, he showed them the room where they could settle in. Meanwhile, the children rushed towards him, laughing and hugging his legs, as if competing for the tightest embrace. I hugged him tighter, one of them exclaimed, laughing, wrapping his arms around John. No, I hugged him tighter, another little one shouted, pressing against him. John, no longer holding back his emotions, hugged them all tightly, feeling the warmth and happiness he had never experienced before. Go get some rest, he said, his voice choked with tears, a smile on his face. Tomorrow will be a special day. Irina watched from a distance, seeing how this man, who initially seemed cold and distant, was changing before her eyes. It was evident that the love of these children had transformed him, revealing a completely different person. The next morning, they were awakened by the brilliance of a radiant sun, and John, Irina, and the quadruplet set off on a day that promised to be unforgettable. Their first stop was a designer clothing store, where the children, like Irina, enjoyed trying on new outfits. Each new outfit elicited a joyous response from the little ones. After choosing all the essentials, they headed to an elegant restaurant in downtown LA for a delicious lunch. After lunch, they went to an amusement park, where the children delighted in riding swings, carousels, slides, and miniature trains. Their joyful laughter filled the air as they played and frolicked in the fresh air. But they didn't know the unpleasant surprise that awaited them at home. To end their full day of fun, they went to a famous ice cream parlor, where the whole family enjoyed large portions, sharing smiles and laughter. It was a day of pure joy and happiness that they savored more than ever before. When they returned to the mansion, the atmosphere was calm and peaceful, but as soon as they entered the foyer, they were met with something unexpected. An elegant woman, with a refined appearance, stood at the far end of the hall. She was wearing a luxurious fur coat, sparkling jewelry around her neck and ears, her hair meticulously styled in an exquisite manner, as if she had just stepped off the runway of a European fashion show. John stopped as if paralyzed at the sight of her, his face turning pale. Who is this lady? Irina asked, confused by the tension reflected on her children's father's face. John didn't answer, as if he had lost his voice. Noticing his confusion, the woman took a step forward with a light, confident smile. Allow me to answer for him, dear, she said. Her voice was laced with icy arrogance. I'm Emily, a fashion designer and John's fiancé, I came to marry him. Her words hung in the air, and John's heart seemed to stop. What are you saying, he exclaimed, stepping forward, his gaze fixed on her full of bewilderment. I didn't propose to you. You know I'm not a fan of. Emily, not losing her composure, let out a sarcastic chuckle. Her gaze swept over the children, then over Irina. She scoffed disdainfully. My dear, she declared, with a cold undertone, you'll change your mind soon. But tell me, who is this modest lady and who are these four children who look so much like you? The question threw John into confusion. He was at a loss for words. Finally, Irina spoke. My name is Irina Orlova, she replied firmly. And these are my children. She paused, deliberately meeting Emily's gaze, then John's. I'll correct myself. These are our children. They have a wonderful father, and I'm sure your fiancé is a wonderful dad, too. Irina's words had the effect of an exploding bomb. Emily's face contorted in anger. Her eyes narrowed, and color drained from her face. How can John be their father, she exclaimed, her voice growing louder with each word. Why would someone like him pay any attention to a modest woman like you? 
It's well known that John always preferred women from high society, beautiful and sophisticated. She smiled condescendingly, adjusting a stray strand of her perfectly styled hair. Our relationship has been going on for a year, and it's the most serious he's ever had in his life. John felt a storm brewing within him. His gaze darted between the arrogant Emily and Irina, whose eyes expressed a mixture of determination and vulnerability. Gathering his strength, he interrupted her self-assured statement. Where did you get the idea that we're getting married, he demanded, his voice harsher than usual. Emily didn't immediately respond. Instead, she went to a couch, accustomed to being the center of attention. From her expensive handbag, she pulled out an image and displayed it to John, smirking. We're expecting triplets, she whispered with a venomous smile. We're expecting three children. She slowly unbuttoned her coat, revealing a rounded belly where a pregnancy was beginning to show. A heavy silence descended upon the room. Irina's eyes flashed as she looked at Emily. Madam, she said calmly but firmly, a person's value isn't measured by the luxury they wear, but by the strength and sincerity of their love. True gold doesn't always glitter on the surface, it hides, waiting for those who know how to look deeper to find it. Without waiting for a response, Irina turned to John, a warm look in her eyes, as she gazed at the children. I'll take the children to their room so they can rest. I presume you two need time to discuss the preparations for your wedding. Her voice trembled on the last word. The silence that followed was almost suffocating. The children, clutching Irina's hands, followed her as she started to ascend the stairs. But John, with desperate resolve, broke the silence. Wait, Irina, he called out, his voice full of urgency. Don't leave. Emily stepped forward, indignation in her voice. Why would she stay? What's the point in her staying here and listening to our conversation? We have a lot to discuss. After all, we're getting married, my love. John looked at her with icy eyes and a firmness he had never shown before. There's nothing to discuss, Emily, he said harshly. It's over. With those words, he turned away from her and approached Irina and the children, leaving Emily in shock and confusion. Emily, struggling to regain her composure, shot John a look of fury. She tried to regain her self-assurance and with cold disdain, turned to Irina. Leave this woman. Let her go with her children. Forget her, treat her as a mistake. Let's focus on our future. Irina held her children's small hands tighter and met John's gaze, where a serious decision was clearly brewing. She turned and resolutely continued up the stairs, unwilling to be a witness to their conversation. But before she could fully disappear, the sound of familiar footsteps echoed through the hall. It was the squeak of a walker. John's grandmother, normally confined to her room and barely able to move around the house, appeared in the doorway. Weak but resolute, she took a few steps towards them. Her face held a strength and authority that no one had seen before. What's going on here? Helen asked, her voice remarkably firm for her age. Turning to Irina, who stood on the stairs with the children, she gave a clear, firm command. Come back here, with my great-grandchildren. This is my home, and this is a place for all of you. Irina, with a touching smile and wet eyes, slowly descended the stairs, holding her children's hands tightly. The children, laughing and chasing each other, made an impromptu race to the bottom. Helen turned back to John. Her eyes were filled with questions and understanding. John, she began, maybe you want to explain to me what's happening here. John swallowed hard, feeling the weight of the situation and the tension that bound him. He gathered his strength and replied, Grandma, Emily claims that she's expecting triplets and that these children are mine. She's insisting on getting married. I don't understand how it's possible. Emily, realizing the situation was spiraling out of her control, stepped towards John and took his hand, trying to ease the tension with a warm smile. My darling, she said, her voice dripping with feigned affection, the most important thing is that we're expecting three little ones. It's a reason to celebrate, not to doubt. We've overcome so much together, and now we'll have a real family. But Helen, carefully observing her words and facial expression, saw through the deception. 
Her gaze turned stern, and addressing Emily, she said with ironclad firmness, I'll answer your questions, Emily. And you won't like it. Yes, I call you a liar, and I truly prefer this woman who has nothing but sincerity to you, who are pretending to be part of our family for your own selfish reasons. John's eyes flew open in disbelief as Helen continued. John, my dear grandson, she began, you might have forgotten, but a few years ago you had surgery for a complex problem that required surgical intervention. Remember, you also made arrangements with the doctors for preventative vasectomy. The mention of those difficult times in the hospital surfaced in his mind. He remembered how hard it was to make that decision, how his fear of commitment and the future had led him to choose infertility to avoid unexpected complications. He had thought his grandmother knew nothing about the procedure. Grandma, he whispered, his voice filled with confusion. How did you know? I thought you only knew about the operation, not the rest. Helen nodded slowly, maintaining his gaze. I always knew, dear. I spoke to the doctors privately, secretly to find out everything. I knew about the vasectomy. And though it hurt me deeply, I accepted your decision. But everything changed yesterday when this wonderful woman brought your children here. I realized that life had taken a different course, giving you, and all of us, a miracle, albeit in a different way. Let the love you have for these children be the only truth. Helen's words were gentle, but they carried an unshakable conviction. She looked at John again, her eyes brimming with the wisdom of a long life. John, she said. I knew you never reversed that procedure because I've been monitoring your health all this time, even though you never noticed. I knew you couldn't have biological children from that point on. And all my life, I've waited for a miracle, for fate to give you children in a different way. And here they are, this wonderful woman and your. John felt the ground beneath him disappear. The truth, just revealed by his grandmother, crashed over him like a powerful wave. He realized that with his decision, he had deprived her of hope for descendants, unaware of how important it was to her. Emily, struggling to maintain her composure, took a deep breath and exclaimed, This is absurd. Her voice sounded desperate. She doesn't know what she's talking about. I have proof. Here it is. She pulled out a sonogram picture from her purse, holding it up to John, she smirked with chilling condescension. We're expecting triplets. Helen slowly shook her head. Her gaze was firm and piercing. You cannot be pregnant with my grandson's child, she declared. It's impossible. Irina, who had been silently observing, took a deep breath and stepped forward. She turned to John, her eyes full of sympathy and understanding. John felt a surge of emotions as he looked at his children, who were still happily playing, unaware of the storm brewing around them. He slowly knelt before them, needing to see them better, to feel their presence. He gently stroked one of the boy's heads, catching himself thinking, I didn't know I could love someone so much. Helen, standing to the side, watched her grandson with pride, her heart, which she had held back for so long, finally overflowing with joy. She had long feared that John would never open himself to true love, but now she saw him embracing what life had given him. Finally. John rose, a firmness appearing in his eyes. He turned to Emily, his gaze calm and resolute. It's over, Emily, he said clearly and decisively. I don't know how you managed to concoct this lie, but you can't be pregnant with my child. It's not possible. Emily, realizing her plan was in ruins, looked at him with hatred. Then, she turned abruptly and walked out of the room, throwing a parting shot, I should have stayed in Paris. At least there, my children's father, though a poor loser, would be happy to be with me. Stay with your pauper. John, still deeply moved by what had just happened, turned to Irina and his grandmother, realizing that his life had now completely changed. He took a deep breath, a touch of nervousness in his voice, and took Irina's hand. Irina, he began, his voice trembling. I know I've made a lot of mistakes, and I understand this isn't easy. But if you'll allow me, I want to be the father these children deserve. I also want to be a part of your lives. I've realized I need someone like you by my side. I want to get to know you better. Irina looked at him for a long time before responding. Then, a light, 
warm smile spread across her face. Every new day is like a sunrise, she said softly. Life always gives us a second chance. We can start together. Helen, unable to hold back her tears of joy, stepped towards them, feeling proud of her grandson and how much he had changed. The children, not quite understanding what was happening, ran to John and Irina, hugging them both. A few months later, John and Irina were no longer just living together with the children, they were feeling closer to each other. Irina started dressing up for dates, making pleasant surprises and giving gifts. But most of all, she enjoyed watching him come home, never leaving the children's side, inventing new games and adventures. He delighted in putting them to bed, reading stories and giving them a goodnight kiss. Then, he would rush to spend time with Irina. He was clearly different from the other women who had been in his life. Over time, John began to realize that his feelings for Irina had changed. He no longer simply admired her kindness and care for the children, he felt genuinely falling in love with her. Every move she made, every glance she cast, awakened something warm and tender within him. John caught himself thinking about her even at work, anticipating the moments when he would return home to see her and hear her voice. Irina wasn't indifferent either. Her heart skipped a beat whenever John came home, with that genuine joy she always noticed in his eyes. Seeing him play with the children every evening, read stories to them, and kiss them goodnight with tenderness, Irina felt that the man she had been waiting for, the one she had dreamed of, had entered her life. With each passing day, she felt her affection for him blossom into a deep feeling. One evening, after dinner, John invited Irina for a walk in the garden. They stepped out under the starry sky, and John, gathering his thoughts, took her hand. Irina, you've become a very important person to me, he began. You're not just a mother to our children and someone who warms our home, you're a part of my life, and I want this to be forever. Then, slightly nervous, John reached into his pocket and pulled out a small box. He opened it, revealing a delicate ring. His voice was firm. Irina, will you marry me? Irina's eyes lit up with happiness. She felt her heart swell with joy. Yes, John, she whispered, smiling back at him. In that moment, they understood that they had become a real family. From that day forward, John knew his life had changed dramatically. He had found the meaning that lay deep within his heart, the value that could not be bought with money. He realized that true wealth was found in family, in the laughter of children, and in the simple joys that could never be measured. Thank you for listening to the story until the end. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Does this sound true or more like fiction? Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends and loved ones. It motivates us to continue working on new stories every day.